Hello, this is Joe Neville, and in this video, I'm going to be talking about eVPN VXLAN and asking why is it so complicated? So this is a 15 minute talk that I performed recently. I was only given 15 minutes to, uh, to talk about a subject of my choosing. I probably foolishly, I picked eVPN VXLAN. Um, so obviously I didn't have the time to do an in-depth tutorial in that 15 minutes, but I thought this discussion about the technology is, is interesting and to get people thinking about it and to hopefully help people to grasp and understand this technology stack. First of all, we're going to be talking about what is it and why is it so popular yet hard to understand. And I think really key to that is to look at its history and the implementation, which is what we're gonna do in this video. Okay, so sorry IPv6, this is the hottest, most misunderstood technology in networking in 2022, I believe. And I, I draw that conclusion from being on Twitter, looking online and people asking for tutorials around this and asking questions, you know? And I know that it's really hot because talking to people in the industry, there's a lot of buzz around this. And when I tweet anything about eVPN VXLAN, I seem to get more followers, even though I haven't done a tutorial about it. So let's ask, so let's answer the question like, what is it? Okay, first of all, I should say, the naming of this technology stack is something that's quite complicated in itself. You'll see lots of different permutations of different names being used for it. And the fact that people use VXLAN with a big X or a, like a capitalized X or a, a small X, it is capitalized. VXLAN is all capitalized. It's in the RFC. Please look it up if you haven't. Right, but I have heard recently that Aruba, so the vendor that I work for, their documentation is going to gravitate around the name eVPN hyphen VXLAN. So this is two separate but linked technologies. And I think that's really key. The fact that these it's not just one feature set, it's actually two things operating together, linked but separate. So let's dive into that. So eVPN is working at the control plane. Now the control plane being the part of the networking device that is concerned with exchanging information to build a view of the network. So we're talking routing protocols, advertising their local subnets to their remote peers to find a to gain a view of the network so that they can find the best path through the network. And eVPN is an extension of BGP. So BGP, OSPF, these are the things that are operated in the control plane, and that's where eVPN sits. Now, moving on to VXLAN, this sits in the data plane. So this is in this is the part of the networking device that's concerned about sending packets through the device, like what headers we should put on the data. So concerned with the encapsulation of packets. So eVPN control plane, VXLAN data plane. Now they can be decoupled. eVPN VXLAN is, I believe, the most popular implementation of this technology, but eVPN as a control plane can be used with different data planes. So in the RFC, they use different um, ways of encapsulating the data, such as NVGRE or MPLS or MPLS over GRE. What we're focusing on, obviously, is eVPN VXLAN. Okay, so let's go a bit deeper. Now, what does this technology stack actually give us? What problems does it solve? Well, it actually builds virtual networks for virtual or containerized workloads. What it can give us is layer two, so that's switched, or layer three rooted overlay networks running on an IP only underlay. So what we have is we have our static, well, relatively statically configured underlay, that's our foundation, and then we can build networks on top of that. So virtual networks, because in these modern data centers where we have VMs and containers being spun up and spun down, we can't wait around for those, you know, you've all heard the horror stories, I'm sure, of like a month to configure a VLAN so that these new workloads can speak to each other. They need to be up and down, you know, in the bat of an eyelid. So um, we have our foundation, our underlay, and then we build the overlays over the top, and that's how our new workloads can communicate. And that's what eVPN VXLAN gives us. A really key point is that it's running on IP only, so we don't need any specialized equipment. It's UDP, essentially, that this stuff is running over. It gives us efficient network design as well, so it's not only encapsulation or a control plane, it also gives us some features such as, I mean, I, can't, I haven't got time to go into all of them, or we'll do in future videos, but we, in the past, we had problems where our traffic at layer two would have to go up to layer three choke points to be routed between subnets. So into subnet routing, you'd have tromboning and, and these choke points. So what it actually gives us is baked into this technology stack. We have things like distributed anycast gateways. So yeah, that's coming courtesy of EVPN. We also have, courtesy of VXLAN, we have per packet 
state that we can carry. Now this is from an extension, more about this in a moment, uh, the extension to VXLAN, which is called Group Based Policy. And what that allows us to do is to actually have IDs per packet that are not to do with the source and destination of the traffic or even the VPN. It is like an arbitrary tag that we can add to each one of the packets to group packets together regardless of source and destination and, and those old ways that used to match on your ACLs. So that's per packet header state plus robust routing policy. So we've got advanced path decision and filtering. That comes from the fact that eVPN is an extension of BGP. So we've got all of that from BGP available in eVPN. So that's what it gives us. And yeah, for, at a basic level, there's a lot in there. So there's a lot in this technology stack to get our heads around. But really key to understanding this technology is to break it down in, in, into its component parts. So that's what we're going to do. So starting with VXLAN, as I mentioned, this is an encapsulation type originally positioned in its original RFC as for VMs, for these virtualized data centers that, are, that were becoming popular around that time. A key point to it is that it's been adopted by hardware and by software. So in networking devices, of course, but also in software with virtual switches in the virtual world and even in the containerized world with things like Docker supporting VXLAN for its multi-host networking. But the thing is, and I think it makes people think that there's a lot to VXLAN, where really in the original RSC, there really wasn't too much to it. So it's layer two frames being encapsulated in UDP and then adding an ID for the VPN. So this was the VXLAN network identifier. So in the on screen right now, I've got the original VXLAN header It's eight bytes and most of those bytes were just reserved with 24 bits for the VNI, as I've mentioned. And all that does is say which, uh, which VPN the packet belongs to. So really not, no magic there, I'd say. There was, in the RFC, there was more information about fragmentation and MTU suggestions, but really not so much going on there. But this was extended with group-based policy extensions. And what this does, it takes some of those reserve bits and it assigns them. So now what we have is we have more flags in the header. We have the VNI, of course, and we have this group policy ID. And what we can do with that, as I've mentioned, it's got nothing to do with source and destination of the packet, is carried per packet, and it allows us to subdivide the traffic up to into subgroups, okay? So what that can be used for is creating security groups. So one packet can be um, uh, assigned to a group, which would be something for like R&D, for example, whereas another packet could be assigned to, by, based on certain criteria, could be assigned to like guest, and then those two groups are not allowed to speak to each other. Great for zero trust architectures, so mo modern zero trust architectures, and allowing for micro segmentation because you can segment the network up based right down on the packet layer. But let's have a look at the shortcomings of VXLAN. Now the problem is that VXLAN doesn't have a control plane. It's just data plane only. So the way that it works is like basic layer two switching. If it receives a frame that's destined for a MAC address that it doesn't know about, it will flood it out of all available ports and then it hopes to hear back from that destination. If it hears back from that destination, it records the port that it was learned on. That goes into its layer two switching table. This is just like basic layer two if you know how a switch works, right? And then when a subsequent frame for that destination arrives, it will be sent out of that port. So we have ingress replication, it's called flood and learn, okay? So basic layer two. But this is not good because it doesn't scale, we can't filter so easily. It's just generally inefficient. Okay, a quick edit in post because I think I went a bit too simple with the explanation. VXLAN is not actually going to forward it out of the port, it's going to forward it to the available peers within the VPN. Now, if you want a much more detailed explanation of VXLAN and why we need a control plane, check out my VXLAN explainer playlist, link on screen now. And it would be a great idea to have a control plane if we want to scale up these networks. Of course, with modern networks, static VXLAN with ingress replication is great if you've got like one or two devices. Anything more than that, you want to be looking at the control plane. Step forward, of course, eVPN. So eVPN allows us to advertise MAC addresses and IP addresses of nodes on our network. So each one of the eVPN peers will share its local MACs and IPs that it knows about via specific BGP updates. And this enables both layer two, so switched VPNs, and layer three. So this is powerful and scalable stuff. We're not using flood and learn. 
EVPN is yet another extension to BGP. I say yet another because there's been so many, you know, started off with um, being <laughs> the routing protocol for IPv4, then it was IPv6 and multicast, uh, layer 3 VPN, so labels for MPLS, etc. You know, so this is just another one of those. But EVPN was specifically positioned as a successor to VPLS, so that's MPLS layer 2 VPNs. And it was initially very service provider focused, which was then repurposed for virtualized data centers. And when I was reading through the various RFCs for EVPN and VXLAN, I noticed that there was kind of two trains going on. So first of all, it started off very much as a VPLS successor in the service provider world. And the RFC used the terminology of a service provider. So it was all CESPs coming from the MPLS world. And then there was this RFC here, 7432, which had an implementation of the EVPN control plane, but with an MPLS data plane. But also there were these other RFCs that were focused on data center and the need for overlays to meet the demands of these virtualized data centers that were becoming popular um, and the need for overlays and this, and it was specifically called the network virtualization overlay, the NVO framework. And then EVPN jumped across from the service provider world in one of these RFCs, so the 8365, uh, and EVPN was positioned as the control plane for MVOs and specifically with VXLAN in there. But not only that, because that was layer two, so that was intra subnet uh, VPNs. EVPN was also developed upon to create layer three VPNs with integrated routing and bridging, IRB, in subsequent RFC. So starting very much in the service provider world and then jumping over to the data center world. So when I read those RFCs and I learned that, EVPN started off as a VPLS successor and then moved into the world of the data center and was developed upon. That really made me think about the EVPN family tree. And I think that really informs why this is a complex technology and things like why we configure certain things and why features and name certain things within EVPN is because it's coming from decades of development of other technologies. So starting at the beginning, BGP. So BGP is the advanced routing protocol, isn't it? it? When I was learning networking, it was the last routing protocol that you learned. So you started off with RIP, then you did OSPF, then you did BGP. So BGP in itself is pretty complicated and there's a lot in there. Then there was the developments with MPLS and VPLS, which I've done quite a bit of in the past, but that's pretty advanced stuff as well. You know, so we're building on that. Service provider tends to be for the more intermediate to advanced engineer and there's a lot of new concepts in there, and those were developed into EVPN, creating our advanced VPN uh, control plane. You've got to combine that with VXLAN um, for the, our new virtualization encapsulation technology, and that's how we get EVPN VXLAN. And what this means is that EVPN inherits from these previous technologies. So we have configuration and we have features and terminology that are coming from these technologies that came before it, that it's been developed upon. So starting at the beginning there with BGP, you have the BGP state machine. EVPN updates are BGP updates with special extensions. You also have the advanced path decision process and the filtering that you can get and routing policy from BGP. We see extended communities used a lot with EVPN. Plus then from VPLS, you have the VPN artifacts and things like VRS, uh, route distinguishers and route targets are used a lot within EVPN configuration. But So these are combined, but not only that, because EVPN itself has been extended into layer three with the integrated routing and bridging that I was talking about. And you have different forms of that. You have the symmetrical and asymmetrical. You also have those features, like I said, with distributed anycast gateways. You have things like ARP suppression, and you've got specific RSC mentions of inter-autonomous system setups for EVPN. So this is all pretty complicated stuff. You know, it starts at the beginning with BGP, VPLS, EVPN. Then you've got to combine in knowledge of VXLAN, the encapsulation specific paradigms that you're getting from that, the concerns about fragmentation and MTU, then the extension with the policy to with uh, GBP. And that all combines to create this powerful layer two, layer three VPN solution. So in summary, EVPN VXLAN is powerful, it's packed in with features, giving us these layer two, layer three 
uh, VPNs with advanced functionality, which makes it popular, but it is advanced networking technology, you know, with decades of development to get to this point. So it demands a lot of networking knowledge to actually master this. It means that the configuration is, I'd say it's pretty complex to understand. Or maybe a better way to put it is that initially I found it kind of hard to grasp the relationship between the different parts of the configuration when I was setting it up myself. And I've got a lot of BGP and a lot of MPLS experience. So I'd say that people that are coming to this new, it can be difficult. So don't worry if you do find it uh, confusing to try to understand all of these things if you don't have BGP or MPLS experience. Now, I'll give you an example of, of why I feel this keenly and why I'm giving this talk, really. It's because when I was a junior engineer, I tried to learn MPLS Layer 3 VPNs without knowing BGP, which is completely the wrong way to do it. Because, um, I, you know, you really need to understand BGP first and then MPLS Layer 3 VPNs. And I would say to anybody trying to learn EVPN, VXLAN, I would try to get comfortable with the basics of BGP first, at least. Also then, you know, spend some time learning MPLS layer three VPNs and move on to VPLS. And that will really help you understand things like root distinguishers and root targets that are, you know, fundamental to EVPN's configuration. That's really gonna give you a solid foundation to build upon. The main point with this is take your time. This is advanced stuff. Don't get frustrated and keep at it. Try to break this down into the component parts. You know, don't just think that you're gonna be able to learn uh, EVPN VXLAN by looking at a learning in five minutes YouTube video. It's gonna take some time and to really build up, to really understand this stuff. Okay, so thank you very much for your time. My name is Joe Neville. You can hit me up on Twitter at Joe Neville underscore if you want to discuss this. Uh, if you think I'm talking nonsense, of course, you know, get in touch. It's always good to hear from people. But that was my talk, EVPN VXLAN. Why is it so complicated? Goodbye.